it's raining, so I'm like, I, I immediately get sleepy when it starts to rain. I, it's got to be an evolved thing. Yeah, you want to hibernate when it's raining. Your body yeah. as a mammal says, go indoors and rest, because when it stops raining, you can go out and hunt. Like, that's something that your your evolutionary brain is telling you to do. It's got, it has to be, and it's, I used to think... When I got up for school, you know when you're a kid and you go to school in the morning and you're like, oh, don't turn the lights on, you know? And then if it's raining in the morning, it's just, there's, I know I'm going to sound like a wimpy whatever, I don't know if I'm a millennial or gen whatever, gen X, I'm like right on the border, but I know I know older listeners are going to be like, ah, typical whatever, but I can't function very well under those conditions. Like if it's, early, as a teenager, early morning with rain, my brain was not working. And I remember school ending at like 2.30 or 3. And I'm like, this is my prime time. Yep, like, 100%. Yeah, so I, d I would do my homework and the teachers would see the homework and go, oh, so you are paying attention. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not. I have to figure this out after I wake up at 10.30 a.m. or whatever, physically, sure. mentally. Sure, sure. Jeez, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, man, the sleep research is pretty conclusive, but in another couple decades, they're gonna start school at 10 a.m. because they're gonna realize that they're talking to a absolute- To zombies, yeah. To zombies, to brick yep. walls, and it's gonna be that way for a reason, and it's and, and all they're gonna be able to figure, there's gonna be some metric by which, the, like everyone will have an aura ring, you know, super version, and they'll go, wow, these kids' <laughs> brains are just not working at all at this hour. How, how did we I, start school so early? And it's like, Ask any teenager, they could have told you that immediately. And isn't that the, the new thing now? It's like all these health guys, you know, uh, I'm going to mess it all up. But like Jordan, no, not Jordan Peterson. I don't know. All these health guys are like, Peter sleep, sleep is the key. Yes. Yeah, they're all like, yeah. sleep is the key to longevity and health. And like, that's like their whole thing now, right? Yeah, it, it is. It is. And it, it's kind of obvious. It, it sucks to say this because, of course, like, what do I know? I'm not a doctor. But it's so clear that when you follow your body's natural rhythms, that, that you do better. And like for my kids, and I know I'm going to take, again, older listeners are going to be like, you're ruining your children. I don't wake my kids up. They're small, but I don't wake them up in the morning. I let them wake up naturally every time. And if they wake up at 10.30 a.m., my son's three and a half. He's not lazy, right? If he wakes up at 10.30 a.m., it's because he needed 14 hours of sleep or whatever. And it's... It, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. And now I wake up naturally at a normal time and I get more work done than ever. And it's oh, just, yeah. it's, but I wake up at 7 a.m. because I'm an old fart now at age 43. <laughs> but, you know, if you if you told me eight years ago, five years ago, I'd be waking up at 6.30, 7 a.m. naturally, I'd be like, no thanks. I can't even function before 9.30 a.m., uh, you know, in my 30s. I couldn't do it. I, I force myself. I have a, a 5.55 a.m. alarm every day that goes off, and then I'm in the gym at 6.30. So that gives I just enough time to get up, slug a cup of coffee, and sleepily roll to the gym. And then by the time I get out around 8, I'm, I'm good to go. Like my brain, that switches my brain on. But uh, only when I'm home, which isn't that much. So I, I can't say I'm that disciplined because it's only the like, you know, 100-ish days a year that I'm at home. Well, speaking of, of home, you last came on, I want to say late 2022, uh, early 2023. What if, where have you been since then? Because I, I, I know you're never home, but you also probably weren't, you know, in the coast of Spain on a beach. Oh, God. I talk about your brain fog. Um, where have I been since we last spoke? <laughs> yeah, you, uh, well, you might have to look at your calendar to answer this yeah. question. If I work backwards, I just got back from Baja, Mexico about four days ago. We spent two weeks down there. Before that, uh, I had two really exciting trips. One was on the, the west coast of Australia, a really remote area, looking at the effects of sea snake venom on shark tissue. And uh, so that, that came with its whole own list of difficulties, which included catching sea snakes, taking venom, finding big sharks, taking tissue from them. And, uh, you know, all the typical Wednesday job stuff. And then uh, <laughs> before that, we were in South Africa looking at um, endemic species of sharks and what's going on with the orca situation. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are two infamous orcas there that are just annihilating the great white shark and seven gill shark oh. populations. And wow. so, yeah, we went and studied that for about a month. So, yeah, it's been wow. uh, it's it's been a good year so far. 
I what I thought you were going to mention is you've probably seen this. I'm sure there's orcas that figured out how to sink boats. Have you heard about yeah. this? Yeah, yeah. I just so, just read read about this the other day. It's incredible. So that's terrifying because I'm already like, <laughs> don't go in the water it, it, for no reason. Like I realize I'm sure. probably mostly safe in the ocean unless I'm with you, in which case I'm chasing <laughs> the most venomous snakes on the planet. But most of the time you're safe in the water and everyone's like, it's fine. And like killer whale. Oh, they just called that because they kill sharks and look like dot, 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 shamu. And meanwhile, they're like sinking yachts that are just minding their own business. And they're like, no, we've had enough of your shit, humanity. We're taking you down. It's an interesting thing because nobody's sure whether or not this is a learned behavior because orcas are incredibly intelligent and they are able to teach their offspring and teach others how to do behaviors. Um, well, sorry, I should restate that. We do know it's a learned behavior, but we don't know whether it's a learned behavior of aggression because one orca had a bad instant experience with a boat and now is taking it out on boats or if it's a learned behavior of play because they find it fun. It's like an activity for them to go and harass these boats. And we don't know. And I mean, like how much of, if that was a human being, you would say that this is a psychopath, right? Like, oh, yeah, are they enjoying yeah. it? Are they doing it out of aggression? We don't know the answer, but because we don't fluently speak Orca, and we do actually speak Orca a little bit, but because we as humans don't fluently speak Orca, we, uh, we don't know the answer, which is pretty crazy. It is crazy. I, I understand how terrifying that would be. And I'm not saying like, good, those those boaters that were just enjoying a relaxing weekend deserved it. But I totally get the perspective of the orca being like, huh, most of the time when these come through, they throw garbage off. We choke on it. We die from this. We get hit by their propellers. They make a ton of noise. Uh, they leak poisonous substances. Maybe we should keep these things away from our kids. And they're like, I know how to do that. Bash into it as hard as you can, and eventually there'll be a <laughs> hole in it. And exactly. it'll tip over, and they'll never come back. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, it's... Wouldn't it be crazy if we looked back, you know, in 15 years and we're like, hey, remember when we used to be able to go on the ocean? Huh, those mm -hmm. were good days. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll still be able to go. You just need like a metal hull that is orca proof. It'll be like totally. Uh, yeah. If you want orca proof yachts, you need to add twenty five thousand dollars per square foot for the protective coating that makes it so uh, that an orca can't destroy your boat. They'll have to retrofit. All these as rich if, people will be crying because they have to retrofit their catamaran. As if the world catamaran. isn't crazy enough. As if the world <laughs> isn't crazy enough. Now we have orcas attacking boats and we've got to retrofit our boats to go out in the sea. I mean, that's not really the case, but they're, how they're funny would that be? Their, they're trying <laughs> to earn their reputation. They're like, killer, you know, you, they call us killer whales. Let's show them. Let's show them what we're made totally. of here. Let's totally. earn this <laughs> reputation, this moniker. <laughs> um, the sea snake thing sounds... Sounds scary. Sea snakes are poisonous if memory serves, right? I'm, I've watched a couple Nat Geos. They look really scared. And if they bite sharks, I assume they're smaller than sharks and they kill them with the poison, which means the poison's got to be pretty potent stuff. Yeah, so first of all, I'm going to be that annoying kid from school that corrects you because snakes Do aren't it. poisonous, they're venomous. They're venomous, um, yes, I knew that. Right. I knew that from yeah. last time because I think we had this exact exchange last oh, time. Oh, did we? I'm never going to get that remember. right, by the way. <laughs> I'm, ne I'm never going to get it right, just accept That's that okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. But um, yeah, the difference being, so venom, an envenomation occurs when sub, uh, toxic substance is injected into you versus when you consume it. That's a poison, ah, right? Okay, um, interesting. And so the question, and we, maybe we even talked about this. I might have been re getting ready to go for this one. I don't even remember. But, um, you know, we went to look. Sea snakes are lethally venomous, you know, to the point. And it's interesting because they're totally silent killers. What their, their venom does is it's paralytic. It paralyzes their prey, which is fish. And it does that by stopping their heart and stopping their lungs. And it's pretty much untraceable. So, um it's a very, very scary toxin, and I had a pretty ridiculous uh, mistake run-in. Probably one of the closest run-ins I've ever had, actually. Uh, so we're out in Western Australia. We're looking for these sea snakes to test the toxicity of their venom, right, and milking them and so on. And so we come across wait, the, wait. the first... <laughs> Hold on, pause. Yeah, How do you no milk problem. a sea snake? Is that literal, uh, or are you, like, juicing its head somehow? No, no, hey, you can milk anything with nipples, Greg. Um, no, <laughs> yeah, I have nipples. Uh, I have nipples yeah. for us. Can you milk me? <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> um, no, yeah. So, so milking it is uh, a process done where you take the snakes, and you know, tr with traditional snakes, you have like a jar with a clear film over it, and the snake bites on, and the venom drips out of the of the fangs from the venom glands. 
Sea okay. snakes, however, have tiny little venom, so you have to catch them, hold their mouths open, and then take a pipette and run that pipette up the tooth, up the fang, and then pipette out the venom from the venom oh, gland. So wow. it's a very, very delicate process. And what's sure. crazy is, um, you know, you can't do this with big bulky gloves on because you don't have no. the dexterity. And I was going to ask if you have snake venom gloves or if you're just winging it, man. I mean, we have gloves that we use for some of the handling, but you can't do the venom extraction using the gloves because um, because you need the dexterity of your fingers and you need to be able to operate these micro pipettes and oh, things like that. Man. And so you're there holding literally the most lethal biotoxin in the world where one microgram, one drop, one flick getting in your in a crack in your skin, in a in a cut uh, in your eyes or ears or mouth or nose will ultimately just kill you in a matter of six hours without any real side effects other than feeling a bit lethargic. Oh, um, no. And so if you want to hear about what I did, which was dumber yeah, than dirt. I, I um, do, but I want I want to highlight that for a second because that's that uh, that amount of poison, that's like ricin or something. And I only know that from Breaking Bad, right? But this tiny little piece of of this or it's like the, how they say like enough fentanyl to cover the head of a pin can make you have an overdose that's like that level of toxicity and you say no side effects meaning you don't know if you've ingested it where you're like oh god my lips are numb i better run to the nearest hospital and get them ready exactly. to have me on life support you're just like i'm fine and you go eat lunch and then you keel Correct. over and you're like guess i wasn't fine and you're dead and not Terrifying. only that, but the the life support that they can offer is pretty minimal. Uh, you know, the anti-venom for sea snakes, it does exist, but in very low frequencies and low, low. It's just like it's just it's a no win scenario. You're not getting out of there alive. But, <laughs> OK, so um, how did you so, almost succumb to this particular toxin? So dumb, Jordan. <laughs> so I'm, uh, you know, I'm 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 sitting there milking the snake. I've got adrenaline coursing through my veins because I've got this this lethally deadly snake in my hands. I'm holding its mouth open. We're pipetting, um, you know, we're pipetting up vertically. So if you imagine the snake's mouth is open and I've got the pipette up like this and I'm, I'm taking the venom and I'm putting it into the uh, into the vials and some of the venom and, and other liquids are running down because you're you're dealing with a sea snake. It's just come out of the ocean. Everything's wet. Your hands are wet. I just caught it in the ocean. There's 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 liquid around right mm -hmm. and i'm when i'm when i'm doing something that borders on you know just life threatening like this i'm usually laser focused and this this case was no difference there was no exception i'm laser focused i'm focused on the snake i'm focused on the job that i'm doing and i'm pipetting this uh this venom and i'm putting it in the vial and i get all done and the snake goes back in the cooling bucket so that the snake doesn't overheat and the the venom goes into the cooler and then my cameraman, who I will name here so that he gets in trouble because he's one of my best <laughs> friends, <laughs> Mitchell, who's always arguing with me. We're always arguing. We're like we're like a married couple in that regard. He starts arguing with me about a shot or a drone shot or something. And I'm one of those people that when they're uh, when they're frustrated, they put their fingers in their eyes. Oh, so he starts God, arguing me with me. Yeah. As soon as I'm done, I go like this and I rub my rub my eyes like this with my fingers. And I'm like, God damn it, Mitch, I don't care about your drone shot or whatever it is. And as I'm doing this, as I'm rubbing my, my fingers in my eyes and frustration, I, I just like have this moment of, oh, fuck, because yeah, I haven't clarity. washed my hands. I haven't done anything. I've literally just put the snake away seconds ago with all of this fluid around, like I said, not knowing if some of the venom had leaked down the pipette and into my fingers, the same exact fingers I've just stuck in my eyeballs. And um, I just and I literally like your eyeballs, this stuff. Oh, yeah. Can just go through your. Oh, yeah, because membranes or whatever. Exactly right. Wow. Yeah. And it enters into your bloodstream. It's just the same as being bitten. And so I did this and all of a sudden I just went silent. And Mitch was like, wait, what's wrong? Because he's used to me arguing with him. And I'm like, I think I, I think I just killed myself. And he's like, what? And I was like, nothing. And so I just said nothing because I didn't want to like freak the whole team out because there's, a, there's yeah. a crew of us out there, right? There's 12 of us. We're hour, we're like 10 hours from civilization. Like we're not, we're not, there's no, there's no help coming. And so I know what I've done. I try, I, he, I, he like brushes it off and I just get kind of quiet and I'm on the boat. And this was at the very end of the day. So I'm like, okay, we're done for the day. You know, we finish up uh, shooting and finish up getting our samples and we're in the boat back to, back to the place that we're staying and we're boating back. And whether you've been injected by <laughs> sea snake venom or whether you've just had a really long day of diving and catching snakes, 
you're coming, you, you start to feel fatigued because you're exhausted, right? right? Oh, I've been man. in the water for 10 hours and I'm like, is this it? Like the fatigue is really kicking in. I'm exhausted. And so we go back to the house. Everybody cracks a beer. Like I'm having a beer. It's, it's I'm not saying anything. I'm a little you bit quiet. Well. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I might as well. Everybody, while you're at it. Yeah. Everybody keeps asking uh. what's wrong. Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. Sorry. I'm just tired. And, uh, and so then I literally, they're like, all right, we're going to go out and get some dinner. Cause there was a little like restaurant near the house we were staying in. Um, and, uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to skip dinner. You guys have a good night. I'm tired. I go to my room. I write a note to my wife and son oh, saying no. like, I love you guys. You know, if anything happens, blah, blah, blah. I put it on the nightstand next to the bed. I get into bed and I go to sleep and I don't even think about it. Wake up in the morning, feeling totally fine. Crumple up that letter, <laughs> throw it in the trash. I'm like, I'm good to go. Nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, you can still call the wife and kids and tell them you love them, but I bet it was a pretty nice morning. Like, be best morning you've ever had. You, hangover, no hangover, three, four hours of sleep, no problem. Best, good. best freshest good. morning in totally. your life. Wow. And, and, and I tell this story to my buddy Patrick, and he goes, well, why didn't you just call Jess, your wife, and like say something? And I was like, if I had randomly called her out of the blue to start professing yeah. my love to her and my son, she would have known something was up. <laughs> and then I would have had to tell her what had happened. And then she would have been freaking out all night. Oh, yeah. You know, like it just would have it just would have snowballed the whole thing. And so I just said nothing. I wrote a little note. I apologized to the crew in the note about having to deal with me in that situation. And uh, and yeah, I woke up and everything was fine. Crumpled up the letter, went out, had a cup of coffee, didn't say anything. Was like, I'm good, baby. I'm back. <laughs> oh my god! Like uh, apologies in advance to uh, what was his name, Mitch, for having th thinking that he killed me. Um, yeah. By yep. arguing about a drone shot, not your fault. Yep. Love you, nope. bro. Like well, all these maybe. little loose ends. Like what else? <laughs> Here's my Bitcoin wallet password. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's <laughs> that. That is so. Ridiculous. I mean, it because oh, there's not nothing you can do, right? You're, did you try to wash your eyes out or anything? Is it, there's no point, is there? There's no. It's too late. It makes no difference. I mean, oh, I man. sort of did. You know what I mean? In the sense of like, I I like poured some water over my head, but it was just like it, it's done at that point. If the venom was on my fingers and in my tear ducts, that's that. There was nothing more that could be done. So if the sea snake bites a shark, are we talking about a big shark? Because what's the it kills this big thing. How does it eat that thing? It can only have a few bites for it's full. And then what the rest just rots? Yeah. So um, that's a good question. So a sea snake would never eat a shark typically. Right. Okay, Instead, okay. what happens is you have tiger sharks, which are known as the dumpsters of the sea that will come along and eat pretty much anything they can fit in their mouths. Now, this is where the mystery sort of gets really interesting. When a tiger shark would come up and eat a sea snake that was lounging on the surface, sunning itself, whatever, odds are it would kill it. But as many people know, sometimes when you decapitate a snake, it stays alive, right? Like the head keeps biting. It's like you see those videos on YouTube or whatever. Now, a sea snake would never have the ability to envenomate a shark through its skin because sharks have big, tough, rough, sandpapery skin. But, but, and this is where it becomes so fascinating, if a tiger shark were to come to the surface, chow down on a sea snake, bite it in half, let's say, and put the uh, the bitey end in its mouth, that sea snake would then have access, while still alive but dying, to the soft tissue, esophagus, throat, stomach, etc., of Ouch. the tiger shark, and all it needs in a defensive strike is to bite once and inject that venom into the mouth or, or stomach of the tiger shark, the lining, and then the venom's in the bloodstream. So... You know, we had to go through a pretty rigorous uh, test to see would tiger sharks eat a sea snake? How would they do it? Would they be able to bite it in half? And we did all this for Shark Week, by the way. It's all coming out in Discovery later this year on in July. But um, it's uh, it's pretty cool. It was a pretty, pretty wild adventure. Is, is this this is probably a dumb question. Is this knowledge just for the sake of, hey, we want to know this random th these kinds of random things and we're also finding out the toxicity of the venom? Or is it just like you're looking for something else and you find out these kind of random factoids? Because it seems a little weird to be like, hey, you know what? I really want to know if a tiger shark would bite a sea snake and if the sea snake would then bite the tiger shark's uh, inner mouth lining. Let's spend tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the answer to that question while filming it. So it's actually motivated by the fact that tiger sharks uh, have mysteriously been washing up dead on beaches of Western ah, Australia interesting. with absolutely no known 
issues. Like you look at them and the autopsy goes, they're perfect. There's no microplastics in the gut. There's no lacerations. There's no injuries. There's no bruising. There's no hemorrhaging, nothing. These animals are perfect. Why is a 16 foot immaculate, healthy looking tiger shark washed up dead on a beach flawless? And so my theory, my hypothesis was this was the reason, these sea snakes. And so we went to study this to try and answer whether or not that was those they were the culprits. God, it just seems like such a random co confluence of events that a tiger shark would be like, let me eat this. Oh, there was a sea snake in there. Ah, I bit it in half and that half is in my mouth and it bit me. Yep. And it just seems like that's like winning the lottery or or getting hit by that's the shark equivalent of getting hit by lightning. Yep, it is. Yeah. But it happens, right? Yeah, it happens. I guess and that's so. the thing. If if what's uh what is it? Not Freudian. What's the thing? Anything that can happen will happen. What is it? Yeah, uh, just straight up probability, but I don't know exactly what you're aiming at yeah, right now. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter. But anyway, yeah, but it was really cool. It was interesting. That part of Australia is absolutely incredible super wild that Ningaloo Reef region is, you know, next to the Great Barrier Reef. Honestly, it's way more impressive than the Great Barrier Reef, if you ask me, as far as life and biodiversity. But yeah, it's just a really cool place to be. Tons of marine life, big snakes, big sharks, like you name it. It was awesome. So speaking of giant snakes, oh, well, actually, these sea snakes, how big are the sea snakes? They're not that big because you can lift it up with one hand while milking it with the other, right? So are they kind of... Yeah. Like six, seven feet long. You know, some of them get about as okay. thick as your forearm. Uh, some of them are sort of skinnier and, and lankier. The problem is the maneuverability of them. They're not, the bi big snakes are usually not scary. It's the small ones that are scary. They're more maneuverable. They're faster. They can whip around and get you. If a snake's eight feet long, you can grab it by the tail and sort of pull, and its head can't get there very quickly. If it's a foot long, the second you touch its tail, it can whip around and bite you. So yeah, yeah, no, they're uh, they're they're very maneuverable little buggers. <laughs> Jeez, I remember getting bitten by this baby brown snake, and I don't know if it's poisonous or venomous. Sorry, in the United States, I know in Aus is it in Australia the brown snakes are super venomous. Brown there's, snakes uh, are yeah, yeah deadly for sure. There, there's something in the United States that's a brown, it's literally a brown snake, and it's not, it does bite, because it bit me, but luckily, I remember it was in Boy Scouts, it was a tiny little, it was like three inches long, baby snake, it bit me, but I had a callus on my finger from doing stuff with wood, firewood, at Boy Scout okay. camp, and it didn't, okay. the teeth didn't go through the callus, and I remember hmm. thinking, did I just narrowly avoid going to the hospital slash dying, or is this just a snake that has no venom that just happened to bite me because I was f screwing with it? I Where was this? Know. What part of the this country? Michigan, northern Michigan. Odds are, odds are it was a, it was a harmless garter snake or water, snar or water snake, but uh, yeah, okay. you'll never know. You'll I will never, never know. know. I found it in a vending, <laughs> in a vending machine, in a coin return the of snake? a vending machine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's it was bizarre. warm in there. It was warm yeah. in there, so it probably huh. like figured out how to get in the vending machine. We look for quarters in the coin return, as you do when you're a kid, and I found uh, a little tiny snake. And everyone, but I was in. It was cool at the time. Now it would absolutely give me nightmares, and I would never yeah. <laughs> touch it. But as a kid, I was like, "Whoa, I found a snake!" And everyone's like, "Sweet, bring it back to the tent and keep it next to where you sleep. What could go wrong?" Uh, <laughs> Well, but I still I, do that, and I'm not a kid, you so do that. don't, don't yeah, you sweat get paid it. Yeah. To do that. You get paid <laughs> exactly. to do that now. Yeah, You're exactly. famous for that. I, yeah, all <laughs> I did was uh, almost, yeah, pr either almost at least have a puncture wound on my hand uh, at, at the very sort of best-case scenario. What about giant anacondas? People tell me these stories like, oh, when I was in the Amazon, I saw a 20, 30, whatever, add number of foot anaconda or snake, but it always sounds like something... I'm like, oh, did you do uh, ayahuasca when you were down there? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, that didn't really happen then. You're just confused and had a right. fever dream, and now you think you rode a snake or something like that. But are they are those real? Do they exist? And how big do they get? Well, it depends on your definition of giant, but there are certainly giant snakes. I mean, my team and I were catching 20, 19 to 21 foot anacondas in oh, wow. Brazil. Yeah, uh, just just about a year and a half ago now, and you know we've I've caught bigger reticulated pythons around that length. I've seen African rock pythons that get up to like eighteen feet. So I mean, there are big snakes. I think the stories you hear are the forty foot snake and things like that. I don't think people realize how large forty feet is. You know, if you see a twenty foot snake, which weighs five hundred pounds by the way, and is as thick around as the trunk of our bodies. You think that that's for a 40 foot long animal, right? You look yeah. at it and go, holy crap, look at the size of that thing. 
And you just, you know, you tell your friends, oh, I saw a 40 foot long snake or a 30 foot. Everybody embellishes everything. That's part of storytelling. Right. But, yeah. um, you know, I think that's what happens. And the rumors and the legends go bigger and bigger. But I'll say this snakes, like most reptiles, while it does slow down, they grow until they die. So all it really takes is a, a snake to live a really long time of a large species to live a really long time. And sure enough, you get a really big snake. I was curious about this because every photo that I see, it's either a super wide angle lens or it's next to a person that would have to be like two feet tall for it to scale correctly. And if you just look at it for more than a few minutes or seconds, you realize it's, what is it called when something, when they do deliberately distort the photo using a lens and it's, there's a term for this. Forced perspective. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. forced perspective where you see this and you go, wait a minute, that would make this tractor really, really tiny or or something along those lines. Like this doesn't make it. This car must be the smallest car anywhere if it's this length or it just doesn't make any sense or our huge biggest car. So where do these big snakes live? Amazon definitely heard the guys who are the guides talking about big snakes. But again, storytelling, where else would these live? The ocean seems like a likely place for a big ass snake. Yeah. So Amazon and Indonesia, Southeast Asia are the main two, because that's where you get reticulated python, Burmese python, referring to Southeast Asia and and uh, um, and then uh, and Indonesia. And then the Amazon is where you get anacondas. But and I was telling I was telling Rogan about this. There's a fascinating story of a Colonel Remy something or other who was a Dutch pilot during World War Two, highly decorated where him and his two colleagues in the helicopter were flying over the Congo, a location where giant snakes are not reported to live. And all three of them reported, I want to say 50, I don't know. I I said it wrong on Joe Rogan, got blasted. But um, uh, they reported like a 50-foot snake in the Congo. And all three of them saw it. They even got a photo of it, if you Google it. Um, And they flew over it it three times. Yeah, they flew over it three times and got a photograph of it. And it's pretty remarkable because there are not supposed to be big snakes in the Congo. And the Congo is undeniably one of the least well-studied jungles and areas in the world. And also, by the way, it makes perfect sense for there to be a giant snake there because all these snakes hang out in wet, tropical, dense forest, which is exactly what the Congo is. Every large, wet, tropical, dense forest on the planet has its own version of a large snake, except for the Congo for some weird reason. So why it doesn't have a big a big wetland snake like a reticulated python or anaconda with all of those prey sources is hard to say. So I believe there's a lot of validity to the story. I don't believe that it was 50 feet long and lunged at the helicopter the way that they think it's, it did. It says 25 feet here, according okay. to like the guy's own account, which still is enormous. And Massive. also they were in a helicopter. Massive. So how do they know? Yeah. How long it wasn't. I, I mean, it's it's they do have a photo, but it's 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 a World War Two photo taken from a moving helicopter and a handheld camera. So whatever. Um, but y- yeah, it, that that's still a big darn snake, man. I think any snake, snake over a couple feet long is like hard pass for me. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to sh- pull up photos on here. I'd show you some of the like 20 footers that we've caught, but they don't look 20 feet. I mean, I look tiny next to a 20 foot snake, you know, and uh yeah, I don't know. It's hard to explain. A 25-foot snake is a very, very large snake that's incredibly powerful and incredibly capable of, of hurting someone. I mean, that's a big animal. What do they? What would they do to a human? Would they actually eat a person or would they just squeeze you until all your bones break and let you writhe around until you die? Well, both. I mean, uh, anacondas have never really done it, but uh, there's a tribe called the Aida tribe in the Philippines, and they're a tribe of pygmies who have regular incursions from reticulated pythons, where the reticulated pythons will come out of the jungle canopy and eat people. Now, they're smaller people, like I, I said. I mean, they're I, pygmies. Sucks. Yeah. Sucks to be food size, snack sized. It, fun size, it, a fun sized person in a jungle with big snakes is not a good, not a good It's not a good combo. No. But just scale it up, right? So those are 18 foot snakes eating five foot people. And I'm, I'm making up these numbers, you know, rounding out these numbers. So a 25 foot snake would very easily eat a six foot person. So um, and, and they have, by the way, like there have been accounts of larger people being eaten, especially by reticulated pythons. They're more they're much more likely to attack than uh, than an anaconda. So, yeah, no, they would eat a person. They'd come in, bite you, wrap you up, uh, crunch, you know, basically just asphyxiate you, cr- break all your ribs and crunch you to nothing. And then um, sure enough, they'd uh, they'd. 
uh, <laughs> they'd swallow you up. And I, I don't want to say <sighs> this because I'm fear mongering about something that doesn't really happen. I'm just right. pointing out it's very, very capable. Of yeah, doing that. so 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 gross. I mean, I, we've we've all seen the movie Anaconda, where is it John right. Voight gets eaten alive? So, yeah, we. Uh, and, yeah, I just remember Ice Cube in it, or is it Ice Cube? <laughs> What's his name? Yeah, it's either Ice, ice Cube or Ice T. I can't remember which. It, it's it's been a minute since I've watched yeah. a documentary as fine as Anaconda. That's right. That's right. And Jennifer Lopez. Yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Oh God, I forgot uh -huh. she was in that. That's, that's right. right. Oh my gosh. Yes. So. Look, uh, let's talk about something that's not going to give us nightmares. You went into this cave system in Laos that you said was so big, it has its own weather system. Is that for real or is it just humid in there? No, it's for real. So, you know, you're in you're in like super tropical, dense Vietnamese jungle where it's like 105 degrees out. The air is heavy. It's so humid. And you go into this cave system and parts of it are warm, sticky, humid other parts of it are freezing cold and windy i mean you know keep in mind you can fit an upright empire state building inside of this cave like this is are you not for real that's oh i'm dead serious hard it's to imagine how cave. big that is that's so wow not only wow. is it hard to imagine it's hard to like because you're in complete blackness for the most part and you're shining around even with like our very high powered flashlights you still have a field of vision that's like, you know, the size of a flashlight spot, you know, so maybe six feet wide at the end or something. And you're shining around this cavern that is like, you know, it's like 10 Walmart super centers in width, plus 100 of them stacked tall. Like, it's just it's unbelievably large. It's hard to actually like, wow. yeah, like I said, I mean, you could, you know, you can stand up the Empire State Building, you could land a jetliner inside of them. They're so big. And it's just uh yeah, it's it's sort of unfathomable to be honest. It is incredible how big the Song Doon cave system is. So this is this obviously has animals in it that can't exist anywhere else than I would imagine if there's that much room in there. There's got to have their own ecosystem and everything like the, I, you always see those like blind fish and blind frogs that live in caves. That's that's kind of scary. That I'm having a little bit of a moment here because that big of an empty black dark space is somewhat terrifying for absolutely no good reason. And it's crazy, too, because within it, not only do you have its own weather system, its own endemic species, albeit most of them are smaller, but still, you know, there's unique snails, frogs, fish, so on and so forth, eels. Um, you also have uh, its own terrain. So part of it has, like, white sandy beaches with clear water. Part of it has rushing rivers. Part of it has, uh, you know, very little vegetation where there's no light, as you can imagine. But, um, you know, part of it's really rough, like rocky, difficult to traverse. And where we camped multiple times was like beautiful white sand beaches next to clear water, just in close to pitch blackness. Um, so it's uh, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. What what did you go in there to do to look at some kind of animals in, inside these caves? Yeah, so at the at the end of the six mile long cave system is a big collapse in the cave roof, and there is its own jungle that sits below the floor of the main jungle above. And we were looking for an animal called the saula, also known as the Asian unicorn, um, the most recently described large mammal. They were only described in I want to say ninety five. It's a bovid, meaning related to cows. Beautiful, beautiful creature. And uh, nobody knows whether they're extinct or alive, whether they're gone, whether they're still there. There's odd sightings, blah, blah, blah. And so we, I had this theory that potentially in this jungle, which is so inaccessible, if Sala had made it in there because they, they were known to have some presence around caves and things like that, they would at least remain unharmed. And, and we also, this never made the show, but we also uh, collected a bunch of ticks and leeches, of which there were many, and took their blood to check their DNA to see ah. if the blood in the leeches had been eating Sala. Um, that was inconclusive, but regardless, the idea was to look for this this unicorn, pretty much. This real unicorn, wow. not a fake unicorn, yeah. <laughs> when you say unicorn, do you just mean it's rare, or does it have a horn in the center of its head, like a unicorn? It has two perfectly symmetrical horns that, when looking at it from a side profile, align so perfectly that it looks as though it has one staggering unicorn ah, horn. Wow, fascinating. So this, you said it's a really inaccessible remote place. I'm going to Laos in October of 2024, and I'm like, oh, I wonder if we'll go check out this cave. But if it's super in the middle of nowhere, it's it's unlikely. 
it's in Vietnam. It's in the very middle of nowhere. Um, oh, and it's in Vietnam. Do, I don't even have the right country. Vietnam, Never mind. Yeah, that's okay. But I will say this: if you're going to Laos, where are you going in Laos? I'm not even sure. It's it's a it's an adventure trip with an itinerary where they don't really tell you. They just tell you what to pack because they don't want everybody to complain or make suggestions. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well. I went to Laos uh, in my younger years, and there's probably stories I shouldn't share from Laos, but um, we went to a place, I'm, I'm mixing up the two, it was either, no, yes, it was Vieng Vien, and Vieng Vien was this, I think they shut it down, somebody told me, but it was this backpacker's paradise, it was this river in the middle of the mountains where, and I'll, I'll try and not, uh, try and not, uh, what's the word, like condemn myself here too much. But it's this backpacker's paradise in the middle of nowhere with this river floating through and all of these like hookah bars that serve you anything you can think of, not just hookah, uh, with a bunch of futon couches. And, you know, you spend like 15 cents on a bowl of pho and they bring you the pho and there's uh, there's like family guy on all these TVs in Vietnamese. And then uh, you go float down this river and along this river, it's lined with all these makeshift like rope swings rubber inner tubes, crazy slides, and each bar serves its own specialty cocktail of drugs and alcohol. And oh, uh, <laughs> it's, it, you know, and there's a reason that kids die there because they go and I mean, you know, I won't go into too much detail, but you rock up to the crazy looking bar with the weird techno that's all over the stunning river in this insane location, the bunch of people partying and backpackers. And you're like, how it's like, it's like that, um, the Brad Pitt movie, the or no, uh, Leo DiCaprio the, movie, the, beach, the island, right? The beach, yeah, the, the, beach, the beach, that's it. yeah, the beach. Yeah. yeah, you're like, how did these people get here? Like, this is the middle of nowhere. How did we find yeah. this place? And then, um, yeah, you like rock up to the bar, and the guy's like, "You want a milkshake?" And I'm like, "Uh, no, I don't want a milkshake. I want a beer." He's like, "You, you know, like milkshake? You have milkshake? I put mushroom. I put ecstasy. I put weed. I put, you know." And I'm like, I, I put, you know, opium. I'm like, no, no, no. Oh I don't God. want any of those things in my milkshake. In fact, I'm going to just have a beer. Uh, but yeah, it's, I want to see it's you a open the bottle <laughs> when you, of anything you serve me. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll open exactly. it myself. Yeah, that is, that sounds, no wonder kids die. I, that sounds like a terrible milkshake. Not even just the taste, which I can imagine is absolutely vile. But mixing ecstasy, weed, opium, and uh, mushrooms. Yeah. It does yep. not sound like a good time. And then just, hey, go ahead and have fun swinging from high altitude into exactly. the water. Exactly. What could go wrong? Yeah. Oh exactly. No, it's a pretty wild place. So anyway, if you're going there, make sure you have yourself a nice opium milkshake and good luck yeah. to you. <laughs> oh my god yeah, for 15 cents that sounds yeah. that sounds terrible i would yeah i'm too old for that way too oh, old. oh yeah yeah way too <sighs> old yeah <laughs> i was if too I old for it at 23 so yeah, yeah no it's it's gnarly <laughs> if you survive that milkshake the hangover has really got to be something special like yeah. an unforgettable four days where you are yeah. just hating every minute of life oh no my god. question <laughs> Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. You searching for these extinct or thought to be extinct species, a lot of them, are they just missing in inaccessible areas like this bovid unicorn creature you were looking for basically like look we don't know if it's extinct but nobody's seen one because it's either so remote or it's in a dangerous place is that generally yeah the, that, the that's case? a big that's a huge part of it and, and look since we did that extinct or alive show and i put in all this work looking for these lost species it's become way more of a thing now in wildlife science and biology i think we talked about this last time like when i first proposed the idea I was like a Bigfoot hunter, tinfoil hack guy, right? It was like, okay. you're insane. Like, it's declared extinct. It's gone. What's the matter with you? Like, I had all these old <laughs> professors and stuff that I worked with who literally, like, wrote me off and said I was a lunatic for even proposing such a stupid idea. And then we found one, two, three, eight different lost species. And then all of a sudden, there's now, it's pretty funny when I look at it, there's like, and I won't name organizations or point fingers, but there's like six or seven different groups and organizations that are on the quest for lost species, hunting missing animals and like not hunting to kill, but like all these all these like very notable groups, some of which were the same exact groups that laughed at me and called me a, a quack um, are now doing it themselves and, you know, hiring their own trackers and biologists and blah, 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 which is pretty hilarious because, uh, yeah, it came from a place of like 
you don't know what you're talking about. And the reason, that's a very long-winded way of answering your question, but the reason that I always thought, hey, wait a minute, like this isn't whack job tinfoil hat stuff is because it's so incredibly arrogant to assume that we definitively know whether or not something is gone, especially when it comes to super remote, like other countries, incredibly hard to access places, places, and you, you look at like, oh, when was this declared extinct? Oh, in 1973, some British scientist went there for two weeks, you know, probably hung out in like a really luxurious camp, looked for it. I'm not saying they didn't give it a good shot, but looked for it, didn't find it, came home and said it was extinct. And it's like, that's it. Now we've written off the species as gone. All conservation and funding and hope for it has dried up and, and gone away completely. Doesn't that seem like a whack system that we just trusted this yeah. one guy who went there once 30 years ago for two weeks, you know? And it's like, wait a minute, there's something, the system's broken. And I think that was the thing is like, I realized the system was broken more so than like, I have all these incredibly special talents for finding animals. It was just like, there's, the system's wrong and I'm going to go show you how. That makes sense. Plus, also, they didn't have, you mentioned looking at a tick's blood, looking for DNA. For, like, they didn't have anything like that. So they probably went there, looked around at the usual spots, then asked the guides, hey, when's the last time you saw one of these? Oh, man, I haven't seen one of those for at least a few years. All right, they're all gone. Nobody was looking inside a leech's gut or whatever leeches have for the blood right. Of the species yep. that you're looking for, I, I mean, you said it was inconclusive, but it was a pretty, it's a pretty clever way, yeah. of looking for clues. Yeah, and we we did a lot of that kind of stuff, and still do, by the way, like eDNA, environmental DNA, where you can take a water sample and go, hey, did did this rare fish or turtle poop in this water at all in the last oh, three weeks? You know, like let's check the water, or taking the blood from leeches or mosquitoes. You know, catching a bunch of them and taking the blood and going, did it bite this animal? Um, yeah, we took fecal samples from sharks to see if they were eating these rare seals, you know, like we these sort of uh, innovative techniques of uh, sort of wildlife forensics are the technology is, uh, is advancing. So it's allowing us to be more creative and do more and more of these kinds of tests and things. It's just um, it's a real headache still. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. How many you found? You said you found eight or was that just a, a random eight. round number? How no, many? Wow. Eight, eight is the number thus far. Yeah, eight species that were previously lost to science. It's actually nine. It's just we didn't make a show about the ninth one. Uh, we were there doing uh, human wildlife conflict on spectacled bears in Peru. And then uh, literally the gardener, it wasn't the gardener, but it was like the guy that was in the makeshift kitchen was raking through the kitchen scrap slash compost heap and found this tiny little what looks like an earthworm it was a species of blind snake that hadn't been seen in 70 years. So we've actually wow. found nine at this point. Yeah. So, you know, I can't take all the credit, certainly, because it's there have been collaborations. And like I said, it wasn't me who found the blind snake. It was the guy cleaning the kitchen. But he handed me this this sort of beat up worm looking thing. And I was like, wait a minute, that's a blind snake. And I didn't even know blind snakes occurred in this part of Peru, which ended up being, you know, a lost species. So, yeah, no, we we found nine. And a big part of the message is just go and look. I, I didn't realize how common it is to find new species. You know, you think it just never happens or it requires a decade long expedition because you see things like that in movies. But sure. when I went to I went to the Amazon uh, last or a couple of years ago and there is there's they have a guy who collects moths like that's his whole uh -huh. thing. And he's like, yep. come tonight and look at the moth cloth. And there's this cloth <laughs> with a light shining on it. And there's a billion black light. different uh -huh. different moths. And we all went out there. And he's like, hey, collect moths with me and help me label them and all this stuff, basically real science kind of grunt work as an intern would do. And he's like, you might find a new species. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And it turns out that somebody on our trip did find a new species of moth. And I said, how often does this happen? And he goes, oh, I would say every couple months we find a new one. I'm like, wait, every couple of months Crazy, you find huh? a brand new species of moth, not like a different color of the same one. And he's like, no, right. totally different. And yep. that that is that is incredible that there are just hundreds of thousands or millions of different species of insect animals that we just no one's looked for them because they only exist in this area where there's one guy collecting 100 samples a night. And he's rec literally recruiting like dumbass half drunk tourists, backpackers yep. to help label and categorize these things because there's too many. Unbelievable. And, and what's what's crazy is it's. um. So speciation is one thing, like how you determine a new species. Um, and I won't get into the whole thing of that because as 
as time has progressed, we've got with technology progressing, we've got more and more and more ways to decide that something's its own species. So you have a lot of like hardened academics who's really excited to just name new species. So they look for reasons for something to be a new species. So they look at two two moths that are identical that occur in the exact same location that have the same role in the environment. But they go, hey, there's these are two different species because one comes out during the day and one comes out during the night. And here's a tiny piece of genetic evidence that supports that. And then they get to write a paper and name a moth after themselves. So I'm not saying this guy was doing that, but that is sort of one of the shady is the wrong word, but one of the things that scientists are doing now to sort of give themselves an edge and be like, oh, I named a species. I, I did this. So there's that factor. And then the other is, like you said, a lot of it's just not looking in places that there's, it's just understudied, right? Like who's going to the heart of the Amazon to count moths? Who's going to the middle of Sumatra or Borneo or certain places in Africa or South America or wherever to look at beetles or look at snails or whatever. And then people do it and go, yeah, yeah, find, find a new species every few months, you know, because nobody else has ever looked or tried to do this. So, you know, it's it's not happening in our backyards in California because that's so well studied by by first world science. But it is happening in these remote locations with high species diversity, like tropical wetlands and things like that. And it's uh, yeah, it's fascinating. It's it's so interesting. And I would imagine there's a lot of especially with insects, because in 1950, it was probably really hard to catch a fly that you can barely see and then go, oh, well, this one has different. I don't know. Exoskeleton properties. It would just be hard to even examine something like that at that 100 years ago. And so you have new tech that's even able to look at like the, what is it, the genetic, what what do you call that? The genotype of something and then be like, oh, this uh -huh. is actually new. And we didn't yep. know it because it looks just like another ant. Exactly. It, yeah, exactly. really interesting. I, I wonder how much has conflict and war prohibited exploration of certain areas. I'm thinking like Colombia, right? The FARC controlled all this territory. And then it's like, oh, peace deal. And now you can walk into a place where you would never, ever in a million years have gone a couple decades ago because you would have been immediately killed or kidnapped for 20 years by the FARC. Well, I don't I don't know if that's your perfect setup for what we did in FARC rebel control Colombia or not, but um. Yeah, Go no, it, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so exactly to your point, you know, there was a species of crocodilian called the Rio Apoporus caiman, which is a, a long nosed yellow crocodilian that lived in one and only drainage, the Rio Apoporus drainage, which had been controlled by the FARC rebels since the 80s, 70s, I don't remember anymore. And, uh, you know, literally immediately after the peace treaty was made, when things were still very, very, and they, they still are very dangerous down there. It's like there's still a lot of FARC issues. We went and grabbed a cocaine dealer's uh, giant B, like cargo plane and flew into the strip in the middle of Colombia and went and found this, this lost to science species of crocodilian, wow. which couldn't have been doing better, by the way. It was absolutely thriving in this remote Colombian jungle. It's not like there was one or two left and we found it and oh my God, you know, what a, what a heroes we are for finding it. Not at all. Myself, this other scientist, Sergio, who's working in a different part of the region, I found out later, um, had found massive populations of these caiman because nobody had been going there because the FARC rebels had controlled it and they weren't interested in killing these crocodiles. So there was just uh, there was just tons of them and they were absolutely thriving. They're super healthy. They had tons to eat. Like things couldn't have been better for the crocodilians. They weren't so great for the for the people of the region, but for the oh, crocodilians, really? things couldn't. Have, it wasn't that bad. I mean, everybody was happy and healthy. But, uh, you know, they, I remember that our, our like river guy, the guy taking us up the river uh, was like, Hey, you know, like we were chatting with him one night around the fire and he's like, yeah, you know, been running, running drugs for a lot of years and come up here and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, if you guys had come like a year ago, we definitely would have cut your heads off. But, you know, things are OK now. And we're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say alleged cocaine dealer, but that's by far the that's the least of his crimes, apparently. Uh, oh, no, he said it yikes. like it wasn't even a thing. Jeez, that's uh, that's a little scary. To have somebody say, yeah, we would have cut your heads off, but nah, it's fine now. It's like, really? What? So this piece of paper that's over in Bogota is the reason I'm alive right now? That's mildly terrifying. Right. And keep in mind, we were like the middle and, you know, like he could have cut all our heads off and just buried us and gone about his day, you know, doing whatever he did. And mm -hmm. nobody would have known. Nobody would have, he wouldn't, it wouldn't have made no difference, but his 
whoever his higher ups were obviously didn't care anymore. So they were like, yeah, you don't need to murder them. And it was like, all right, we'll just take you up the river instead. Sure. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. That is that is. Yikes. Yeah, that's that's daring for sure, to say the least. I read somewhere that you found a tortoise where they'd only seen one e ever. And they, of course, they killed it immediately as a specimen because exactly. that's what science yep. was 100 years ago. And you found it, I, I want to say, because somebody said, I saw tortoise bites in a cactus a few years ago, and that was the clue. That's amazing. Yes. And it, it's such a small shred of hope to to bank on. Well, we do all of our expeditions based on like a list of criteria to say, is it likely to still be there? And this one didn't meet that full list of criteria. But my gut instinct, I'm a turtle tortoise guy, right? Like if, look, I'll show you. Like, literally right here, here are a couple of my hatchlings, oh, you know, nice. like I got, yeah, I got, I got. I got turtles and tortoises all over. I love them. And uh, anyway, my I, I'm friends with the guys at the Turtle Conservancy up in Ojai, which, by the way, if you're listening to this, go and Google it. It's an incredible facility. This guy who's, uh, I don't know how he's raised the money, but he's built this insane facility to breed uh, turtles and tortoises, which are one of the most endangered groups of animals in the world because they're being collected for soup, habitat loss, pet trade, blah, blah, blah. And uh, anyway, I'm friends with the Turtle Conservancy guys. I went up there. I spoke to this guy. Russ, can't remember his last name, who'd been on Isla Fernandina in the Galapagos some 30 years prior and had seen bite marks on this cactus and alleged scat, alleged tortoise poop on an island that only one specimen of tortoise had ever been found 114 years prior by the California Academy of Sciences and it had immediately been bopped on the head and stuffed and collected, as you said. Oh, man. And that was the only known specimen of this species in recorded history, period. There had never been another known animal ever. And so, you know, Russ told me about these bite marks. Uh, I, I knew the story from 114 years prior uh, about the California Academy of Sciences. And I was like, man, we got to we got to go look, you know, like. Fernandina Island's incredibly remote. It's incredibly barren and harsh, very difficult to traverse over, uh, volcanic, boiling hot, not a lot of vegetation. And so we partnered with a couple people, the Galapagos Conservancy, the Galapagos National Parks, and, uh, and we funded this expedition to head out there. And myself and those two other organizations all went together and they sent representatives from their organizations. And we had a great collaboration working together. They wanted to go to the top of the mountain because it was the wettest area, which I just didn't believe in. And I wanted to go to a lowland area that had the most vegetation because I thought that made the most sense. And we did their thing first. We're unsuccessful. Then on the second or third day, we did my thing and went to this vegetation vegetative area. And within a couple hours, found this tortoise and everything was wonderful. Collaboration was great. And then it all went a little sour after that. But uh, but we found literally I dove into this bush and picked up the rarest animal in the world, the only specimen living of the Fernandina Island tortoise, the one and only of its entire species. So yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty incredible. <sighs> what do you do? Oh, so, let me back up a little bit. Is the running theory, okay, there's cactus bites in, in, or sorry, tortoise bites in the cactus and scat from this tortoise, they live so long that it doesn't matter that this was 30 years ago or whatever. It could still be there because tortoises Pretty live much. 100 years, yeah. or 200, whatever it is. Wow. Pretty much. What it could have been that exact same animal. The problem is it's a very active volcano. I think it's the yeah. second or third most active volcano in the world. So these limited swaths of habitat get covered up by lava regularly, and it's down to only a few locations of habitat. So, yeah, we went to the one that, like I said, I, I did a lot, you know, Look, it's not like we just cowboy at all, right? Where we're like, oh, let's go. Let's check it out. Like we do a lot of research and prep and planning. And I'd found this location on a map that just based on the vegetation alone, I was like, that's where we got to go. And then, uh, yeah, sure enough, we went we went there. And uh, uh, knowing that the same animal that Russ had seen some 30 years prior could potentially have been in this swath of habitat. Or, sorry, he hadn't seen the animal. The same animal that left those bite marks could still mm -hmm. be alive today. We went to look and uh, and we found her. <laughs> oh my God, what are the odds? The odds seem incredibly slim. Yeah, I guess you're also lucky that that guy knew what tortoise bites look like because otherwise, I mean, if he wasn't an expert in that particular thing, you'd be like, well, what did this guy really see? He saw some poop. He thinks it's from this rare species. Come on. He just happened to be like one of the few people in the world where you'd go, that guy knows tortoise poop when he sees it. Well, and that's the thing too, is because I, as you can imagine, I get, 
dozens to hundreds of messages per week of people reporting to have seen an ivory billed woodpecker, a thylacine, a this, a that, and you know the amount that are What's credible. What's a thylacine? What is that? Uh, Tasmanian tiger. Uh, super, yeah, animal I'm obsessed with. We can talk about that next. But sure. yeah, the, the amount of reports that are credible are very, very, very slim. But when you have a PhD, you know, doctor in, in turtles and tortoises who had been working on that island doing other surveys, I forget, vegetation surveys or something, and goes, yeah, no, I saw a tortoise bite mark. And we're literally sitting at the Turtle Conservancy with, you know, a hundred different species of turtle and tortoise around all taking bites out of cactuses. He's like, yeah, it looked like that. You take that pretty seriously. You know, that's yeah. a credible, that's a credible event. So, um, yeah, that's the thing is, is getting these credible reports and being able to follow those leads and we and weeding through that. Where do you get most of this stuff? I, like Instagram DMs where it's like, hey, man, I know you're this. Check it out. My dad was hunting and he saw this huge. Yep. And you're like, OK, delete. I could probably send you a screenshot of exactly what you just said. An Instagram DM where somebody goes, <laughs> my dad was hunting and he saw blank. But yeah. uh, it comes in everywhere. I mean, in the beginning, we just, you know, scrubbed the hell out of the Internet and would just look everywhere and libraries and old papers and research and then as we began to make a name for ourselves in the space of wildlife and conservation, people would start reaching out to us. And and now, you know, I get a ton of reports through social media, through my website, and uh, most of them are garbage, more yeah, than most th of them. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, it's you're finding it, it's probably harder to find a credible DM or message incoming than it is to find a tortoise in Galapagos. Uh, just and the amount of speak. dick pics you got to weave through to get to those <laughs> sightings. Well, that's just uh, a bonus. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, how do you get something like that? To what do you do when you find that tortoise? Do you try to get them to reproduce? But if it, if it's the only one, well, do tortoises asexually reproduce? I don't even know. They lay eggs. No, so they, they they lay eggs. They do not asexually reproduce, but they they are able to retain sperm for very very long amounts of time. So if that how long female? So uh, I want to say like up to sixty years. Maybe it's less. Maybe it's forty. <laughs> not, I'd have to check. I was not expecting that answer. I thought you were going to say like up to a month. That's, no, 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 no. Wow, 60 it, it, years. It might be, might be 30, but whatever it is, it's a long period of time. So, um, you know, when we found Fern, which was the female tortoise that we found, the one I was mentioning, she was very underweight, very malnourished, had a lot of ticks on her and so on and so forth. So we, not, not something I really wanted to do, but the Galapagos National Parks insisted we take her to the breeding center, the Fausto Lorena Breeding Center on Isla Santa Cruz. So we, we scooped her up. We took her to this, this breeding center. She put on like 11 pounds in like three weeks, which by wow. tortoise stats is wild because she was very hungry, very dehydrated, blah, blah, blah. And the hope was, well, there were there were multiple hopes coming from my end. One was that, you know, maybe she had some sperm retention and was able to, to lay some fertilized eggs. That never took place. And the other hope was that we'd go back and find a male because once we found her, all attention was on that, right? There was no like, all right, let's chuck her in the bag and look for another one. That's not really what you do, right? So, um all attention was on her. But then, um, yeah, the Galapagos National Parks uh, Conservancy, whatever, I don't even know the group's names exactly. They've been back three or four times and been completely unsuccessful, um, which is a uh, pity because I think bummer. if I went back, I think if I went back, we probably would be successful again. But uh, they, 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 they're doing it on their own and they're not doing very well. Wait, why? why so you said you didn't really want to take it to the breeding center. Why? Well, it's just hard. I mean, I wanted her to be... I should restate that. It wasn't that I didn't want to take her to the breeding center. It was that we found this crown jewel rarity of a creature. And she seemed like the right thing to do is what we did. But it seemed difficult to take this animal out of her habitat. You know, yeah, that being sure. said, her habitat sucked. Like it was boiling hot. There was nothing mm -hmm. to eat. She was super dehydrated. She was buried in under a bush like her life was not good. Now she lives in this tropical, like giant enclosure where she's fed cactus fruit all day long and like lounges around in a swimming pool. And I'm not joking when I say that. So her life is great now. But if there were another male in that same patch of habitat, which I don't believe there was, but if there was, he's now got one less breeding female to make. I see right? what you mean. If, yeah. if there's even any of them left. So, um, you know, it was the right thing to do. If the if the management organizations were able to continue successful conservation efforts or continue repeated surveys, but they were not. Um, and so that that is really 
sad and difficult for the species because the outlook for that species is is not it's very yeah, grim it's, at the moment. It sounds grim. Exactly. Is there yeah. a competition among it sounds like there's a little bit of competition among scientists for <laughs> discoveries and stuff. Like, a little I, bit. A little bit. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Because you, you mentioned the moth naming thing and the specia speciation thing. And then I'm, I don't know, I'm not a, I'm no expert, but I, I'm detecting a little bit of maybe a little bit of, you said it went sour and maybe it's like, oh, okay. They're not, you said if we could go back, but I mean, I assume well, it's not you I who can't been, go back. You haven't been no, able to go back. I, I haven't been invited back. I mean, look, Look, there's, 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 I don't want to throw shade at anybody. I'm not going to name any organizations here and say they sure or anything like that. But you don't have to do that. Here's, yeah. what, here's what happens, right? Everybody goes to school. Everybody loves animals. They all get doctorates or PhDs and become researchers or biologists or scientists and then find out that there's absolutely no money in our field, right? There's none. There's like, there's like no money in wildlife. And so everybody, First of all, they all have egos. They all think they did it the right way, like any doctor in anything. They, if it's not their idea, it's a bad idea. Most of these people are not very socially and apt because they're, you know, they're not very so. They're they're socially awkward because they're used to they're animal people and not sure. human people. And then um and they're all competing for little bits of resources because they care about their species, by the way. And that's the important thing to point out here. They're not bad people. There, there are there are always bad eggs and everything, but for the most part, they're people who genuinely care about their species. And if the difference of five thousand dollars can make a huge difference to them, any of these researchers in any of these locations, and if they can be the one to name a species or accept credit or point out that they found something or point out that they saved something, they might get that five thousand dollars that otherwise would go elsewhere. And so, you know, their entire careers, reputations, lives and species rely on these little bit, not little bits, but these these career milestones of accomplishing something. And so there becomes massive like ego and competition and all this stuff, which, Jordan, it freaking sucks because it should be a giant collaboration where we yeah. all work together and, and yeah. figure out how to do the best for the species. But the system does not support that. The system supports everybody working for themselves and trying to do something uh, for their species, which in turn makes people like greedy and selfish. And then you throw human ego into the equation and it becomes it becomes a mess. Yeah, it's it's, it's a shame because yeah, you're right. It should be like a giant collab. But science already is at war with other interests for money and attention and the environment, essentially. it's So it's kind of a shame that there's also infighting just by the design of the way the whole... I guess industry, it, it's not an industry, but the, the way the whole, the whole thing works. It, it seems like some of the, some of the finds are, are skill and experience, but other stuff sounds like it, there's just a little bit of a luck component. Didn't you find a rare shark in a fish market that some guy had caught by mistake or something? I, sure. I can't remember if I read this in your book, but you, you found some shark basically like, wait, you're selling this incredibly yep. rare shark in, in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, so uh yeah, it, a luck component is definitely there, but it takes perseverance and the initiative to go and do the thing before you can get lucky, right? You're not you, like if we hadn't known and I'll explain the shark thing in a second that we were looking for Pondicherry shark, it would have just been another dead shark on the table, right? And so you only get lucky because you're already targeting something and looking for it and putting energy into it. So, with that being said, my wife and I were in Sri Lanka investigating reports that the the believed to be extinct Pondicherry shark had been in the Yala River in this Yala National Park. And uh, me being the, you know, the 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 hero that I am, poking <laughs> fun at myself here, I was like, I'm going to go offshore. I'm going to take 10,000 pounds of chum. I'm going to look, I'm going to get all these sharks around the boat. I'm going to find the Pondicherry shark. I'm going to catch it. I'm going to do all this crazy stuff, charter this boat, get this team, get this captain, get all the divers, do all this stuff. And my wife's like, She's a zoologist. She's like, all right, well, will you do that? I'm just going to go ask around. And she's so like, I'm out on this like six day, like mission, spending way too much money, like, you know, dumping bait in the water, doing all the things that I thought would genuinely attract the shark I was looking for. But, you know, like doing this like big preposterous thing. And my wife's literally walking around fishing villages, chatting to people, showing them pictures of a shark on her phone. And the one guy, she's like, hey, have you seen have you seen the shark? And he goes, 
oh no, shark, I have shark, shark no good, buy lobster, buy lobster. And she's like, no, no, I, I don't want lobster. Do you know the shark? He said, yes, I have two shark, two shark. And she's like, all right, well, can you show me the sharks? He's like, come with me, come with me. So she like walks with him through his hut and lying on a table is literally like 15 beautiful big succulent lobster, a pile of little fish, a, a dead bull shark and a dead Pondicherry shark. Oh and she's God. like, she's like, oh my God, that's the shark we're looking for. And he's like, shark, no good, shark, no good. You buy lobster. And she's like, no, no, I don't want lobster. I want that shark. Right, like, I'm and not the guy's like, this. yeah, yeah. And it, it was so valueless to him that he didn't even want to sell it to her. So she traded him for a box of, she doesn't smoke, but she went and bought it or she, uh, someone on the crew did. She traded him a box of cigarettes for a lost species of shark that is now in the Sri Lankan National Museum. So yeah, wow. it's, it's pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> it, I assume the next round of questioning is like, where exactly did you catch this shark? Do you know? Because theoretically, there's yeah, not just you, one Yeah, you do there, the whole right? thing. You do yeah. the whole thing. Where did you get it? What time of day? What oh, time man. of night? Can we go out fishing with you? We then spent a week fishing with him and of course never caught another one. You know, we found out what estuary mouth it was hanging out at. Uh, we turned all of this information over to the people in Sri Lanka that manage the conservation efforts of that of that habitat, blah, 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 blah. You know, you do the whole thing. It's not like, oh, cool, got the shark moving on. But, you know, like what I do, I'm like the mercenary, right? Like I'm the guy you just call in to find the thing or catch the thing and then hand it off to way more capable scientists than myself to do the ongoing species management. Like I... I don't have time to like be like, OK, you know, like I found this now. Let's come up with a 12 point plan that's going to take 15 years. And like all I can do is be like, all right, we found this animal. You now have a flagship species with which to build a conservation program around and show how important it is because this animal that we thought was gone is still there. Now you can extend your national park, enforce regulations, ideally unlock some funding, you know, so on and so forth. And so that's that's sort of what we do. But we certainly get as much information as we can while on the ground and dealing with it. Yeah, that's I would imagine it takes some persuasion. Do these fishermen think like I'm going to get in trouble? These white people came in and I caught this rare thing and now they want to like bring it to the capital. Are they worried they're going to get heat for this? Sometimes, but most of the time it's in such unregulated places that they it, it's not even a factor. You know, it's it's more like oh, cool, like you like the shark? Like here, you can have the shark. It's it's worthless to me because there is no fishing regulation. There is no enforcement. It's okay that they were gill netting or whatever. Like there's no, they're not breaking any laws or doing anything wrong. So most of the time they don't care. The things that are hilarious that happen is like when we were in Colombia and I'm showing pictures of this caiman, asking if they've seen the caiman. And the one guy goes, oh yeah, very good, delicious. And I'm like, that's what everybody wants to hear. Like the extinct animal you're looking for is really tasty. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you just, you, most of them don't care. Most of them are really happy to show you what they're looking, you know, what they know and where the animals are and so on and so forth. I think you showed me this on Instagram. You might've uh, posed to this. They're using, they, this company is using DNA to bring back things like the woolly mammoth. It, is that, how real is that? Extremely. Yeah. So I'm on the board of conservation advisors for Colossal Biosciences and Colossal yeah, Biosciences. Yeah. yeah, it's a what a company they are headed up by Ben Lamb and George Church. Um, you know, oh, George he's is legit. one of the Yeah, he's like the yeah. OG. Yeah, yeah, DNA. Exactly. Guy. Exactly. So, you know, that that should tell you enough in itself. But, um, you know, look, there are and there will be I can't say too much, but what I can say is you're going to want to see what happens at the end of this year, because there's going to be something that the whole world is going to go, holy shit, at the end of this year. Other than that, what I can say is without a doubt, thylacine, the animal I mentioned, dodo birds and uh, woolly mammoth are all going to be walking around the planet in our lifetime. And I'm working with the team that's coming up with the conservation management plans for these species. Um, and they're all going to be walking the planet thanks to Colossal in our lifetime. And this is this is a big deal. This isn't, you know, oh, I'm just this crazy eccentric Jurassic Parky billionaire. This is this has phenomenal, grandiose conservation applications. Like the carbon offset emit the carbon emission offset from putting mammoths back in the Arctic tundra, the uh the regulation of disease and uh explosion of undulate or not undulates, but uh, fleet grazers in Tasmania by reintroducing the, the thylacine, you know, just the amount of hope 
and like and righting humanity's wrongs that putting the dodo bird back in Mauritius is going to do. It's the most everybody in the world knows what a dodo is, yet nobody alive today has ever even seen one. And, uh, you know, it's crazy. And, and this company is going to bring these animals back and like fix humanity's wrongs when it comes to wildlife. So it's very, very wow. exciting. I don't know about that dodo thing, man. My uncle went hunting once, and he swears he saw one out there. Uh, <laughs> send me the picture. I'll yeah. send you the photo <laughs> in, on Instagram. Yeah. No, that, that's really fascinating. I, can you walk me through the conservation thing? I didn't quite get how putting a woolly mammoth back it did has a carbon offset. Can you explain that With to me? With pleasure. Yeah. With pleasure. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people don't know this, but during the Pleistocene epoch, during the Ice Age, up in northern, like Alaska, Canada, that area, the Bering Land Bridge, that was not big, giant icebergs and, and glacial and crazy deep forest. That was an African savanna like grassland. Oh, I shouldn't say African. It was like an African savanna grassland. You know what I mean? It was this big open savanna. And the reason being, woolly mammoths were up there and they used to knock over trees and they would, uh, you know, they would propagate all of these grass seeds. And so what that does is that that has multiple effects, and I can go into as much detail as you like, but that has multiple effects that ultimately keep the permafrost on the ground longer. And while the permafrost is on the ground and not receding, all of the carbon that's trapped underneath that permafrost remains trapped because the, the habitat stays cooler. So by let me explain it as simply as I can. By putting mammoths back up in what used to be mammoth steppy environment, the mammoths come along, they knock over the trees, okay? When they knock over the trees, that allows the grasses to grow and the ice to form and, and melt and, and ice and snow to create an ice cap over all of that. The mammoths then come along and trample that ice as they walk back and forth over it and push the snowpack into the ground. All of these effects together, no trees that are pulling in sunlight that are breaking up the snow, no insulating snow layer that has a bubble of air under it, so on and so forth, allow the earth to be cooled more up to six degrees. And with that cooling, that allows the permafrost to stay there longer. As the permafrost recedes, as I'm sure you know, that releases all of that dead vegetation that's under there, which has a massive, massive carbon offput. So by putting mammoths back up in that environment, they're going to tailor that environment to be the way that it was before human beings drove those animals to extinction 30,000 years ago and keep the Arctic colder, change the tundra, change the environment. And I'm not talking about the whole Arctic. This is going to happen in portions and it's going to be done very regulated and cleverly and, uh, and ultimately slow down the carbon release some insane number. I don't, I don't remember the metric off the top of my head, which is going to combat global warming. You know, it's going to stop climate change, not stop, but it's going to slow down climate change substantially because we're not losing all of that Arctic ice. That is really incredible. I had no idea. I just thought, it, I guess I never thought about how animals could contribute to protect against global warming. That's really, that is just one of those examples of all the environment and ecosystems being like interlinked to the point of, you know, like, you know, all like connected. in Jenga, where everything yep, is yep. stacked together. <laughs> but then if you pull out enough pieces, the whole thing falls apart. That's probably a decent analogy for this kind of thing. I think I'm the one who might have told that to you, but I you use that have. analogy I, all the I time. I do that I'm... often where I repeat crap to people and they're like, wow, that's, that's okay. really smart. And then I look at their book and I'm like, crap, this is on chapter three. That I just forgot. <laughs> that's OK. Yeah. That's OK. But yeah, it is just like Jenga. It's all connected and you pull out the wrong tile and the whole thing collapses. So yeah. what? What Colossal is doing is they're putting some of those tiles back in. They're making the tower stronger, and that's really exciting. And look, from a selfish standpoint, I'm so excited. You know, I get to see mammoth, thylacine, dodo. I get to interact with these animals that are just so incredible that our early human ancestors got to see and, and interact with and, um, and, and right those wrongs that humanity have caused. You know, dodo birds, we just would come along and bop them on the head out of boredom. They weren't even good eating. And, um, you know, and we wiped them out very, very rapidly. The fact that Mauritius is going to have its national bird back for the first time in human history running around the island, like, that's so exciting. It is so, it's super exciting, and it's it's fascinating that it's going to be possible. Okay, not to rain on the parade. I have a d another possibly dumb question here, but if you bring... No, you're good. If you bring a woolly mammoth back using this new technology, how do, how is it born? Is it born out yeah. of an elephant? Or is Correct. it born in like a two? Okay, so it, it's yeah. something gives birth to it, and it's just it doesn't give birth to its own species. Basically. Correct. So what they do is they take 
Willie Mammoth, and I'm going to try and simplify this as much as I can. And by the way, I'm not George Church. I'm not a geneticist. So I'm the guy that goes, hey, here's how we take care of these animals. You know, not, not here's how we make them. So the how we make them is, in the simplest form of my understanding, is you take it, the closest living relative, in this case, the Indian elephant, and then you take existing DNA from woolly mammoth, of which we have tons. There's mammoth tusks all the, you know, being found all the time and frozen mammoths in the ice and blah, blah, blah. And you compare the two and go, all right, we take this closest living, we take this mammoth DNA. Here are the pieces of the DNA of the double helix that are missing. Let's pull those pieces over from the Indian elephant because they're super close. All right, so now we have this Indian elephant. Okay, well, we know that it, a mammoth was basically an Indian elephant that had a crazy cold tolerance. Add that. All right, we know that a uh, mammoth had a big fat, shaggy coat. Add that. We know it had bigger tusks. Add that. We know it had a larger forehead. Add that. And they genetically engineer all of these pieces of the puzzle and then impregnate uh, a female Indian elephant with an embryo of this woolly mammoth, you know, artificially inseminate it. And then 22 months later, the gestation period of an Indian elephant, it gives birth to a really hairy, big foreheaded so on and so forth, wow. Indian elephant that's actually a woolly mammoth, a recreated woolly mammoth. And so that's, yeah, that's the process. That's so interesting. It, it must freak out the elephant that gives birth to this hairy, freakish looking beast. Especially like, an well, elephant, because they're so intelligent. They're probably like, oh, I f***ed up. Yeah, yeah. who did I yeah. sleep with? What uh, happened <laughs> last night? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, that's, that is so, okay, That that's amazing for sure. Is it's mostly the same DNA, but maybe not exactly the same as a real mammoth. Is that the case then? I, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just blanking on the number and right no now. I want to say it's like 99.6 or 99.8 percent the same. Okay, so I close, mean, close very, enough, very basically. close. Basically, yeah. Exactly. Is it habituated like a real mammoth would have been? You know how sometimes animals that don't have a mother they raise them in a zoo and then it like can't mm -hmm. find its own food because it doesn't know how. Is that going to be a problem for these mammoths? So it shouldn't be because, you know, if myself and the other conservation advisors, and by the way, they have an incredible board of people. Like, I, I highly encourage anybody to go check out Colossal Biosciences website and see who's on their team. People way more qualified and smarter than I am. Um, their, their goal is to not make this, you know, a fluffy, scruffy pet, right? Not something that runs around following a person around because it was hand raised in a zoo. The goal is, I'm sure with the first few, first generation or maybe several generations, there's going to have to be a pretty good amount of human involvement, right? They just, they kind of just throw it out there and be like, figure it out. Um, but the idea would be after reaching a certain point of these animals, uh, you know, they start to replicate and then they can raise their young and so on and so forth. Human contact should become very, very minimal. And, and it should just end up being the same as any other animal, you know, a deer or an elephant or anything else. Maybe they're not scared of people, but they're not habituated and and need people for their survival. That's the idea. It's, man, it's so incredible to think about. Are there any unintended consequences that they might be worried about? Maybe this is a George Church question, but you know how like there's pigs in Hawaii because they brought yeah. them for food and now they screw up everything and dig up everything. Totally. And it, is there time. a is there an issue that could happen with a woolly mammoth with that well, there population? Shouldn't be. There shouldn't be because we're not putting mammoths in Hawaii. You know what I mean? We're not, we're not <laughs> well, introducing yeah, 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 animals. That's true. We're not putting them in places they shouldn't be. You know, we're not re we're not bringing animals and relocating them. And, you know, there's no Jurassic Park zoo being made. This is being made very intentionally and ethically in order to restore the environment, restore species that have been lost, lost. And so, all of the consequences should be similar to everything that we faced in human history. So, for instance, a thylacine was driven to extinction uh, due to the fact that farmers put a bounty on its head because they were killing Tasmanian sheep. OK, so if we get a bunch of thylacine, it's not like we're going to just dump them in Tasmania and be like, hey, good luck to you, you know, because three weeks <laughs> yeah. later, they're going to start killing sheep. So there's going to be a, a fenced in area. They're going to be monitored, blah, blah, blah. There's going to be a big campaign to let people know if reintroductions, rewilding ever truly takes place into the whole island. Hey, everybody, you know, make sure you have a fence around your sheep and it should be an electric fence and blah, blah. So it's not like, it's not like there's just going to, like Jurassic Park, for instance, right? Oh, here's an island where we just dumped all the animals. Come and come and take a train ride. You'll be fine. It's it's not like that, you know? It's, it's very calculated. It's very thought through. I'm only a tiny, tiny piece of 
that group of people that are working on that. But it should there shouldn't be any unintended consequences. That being said, who knows, right? When you put a mammoth back, we're probably going to learn stuff about mammoths we didn't know because they haven't been around for 30,000 years. Maybe they're incredibly docile. Maybe they're super dumb and come walking through people's living rooms. You know, maybe they're really, really violent. The history tells us they're not, but you, you don't really know. But the point is that we're not going to be so uh, hands on with them that we really need to encounter problems. I suppose you could also breed the first few gener generations of these to not be super violent exactly. and to be mostly docile, exactly. but still walk around and, and crunch down snow. It seems like that's yep. something where, I mean, it's so fascinating to be in the beginning of a species. Like yep. you're just, exactly. you have a blank yep. slate, really, with this, what you can do with a, this. This is an this is going to be the biggest news in the world, first of all. It already sort of is in some regards, but when it actually happens, the whole world's going to like come to a screeching halt to see this. Right. For and, sure. um, wow. Yeah. And, and, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, we've been able to engineer them with bigger fur and longer tusks and larger size and blah, blah, blah. I think we could probably make sure, and I'd have to check with George. I'm pretty sure we can make sure they're not, you know, overly aggressive or whatever else, because this is genetic engineering, by the way, you know, like we're not trying to, not trying to pretend it's not, we are, we are engineering animals to be back to what they were some 30,000 years ago. So amazing, man. We'll have to do another show when the stuff is all public, because I know there's a lot you can't talk about on the record, but I, I'm blown away by this. And it, it seems like we could do with that technology. I mean, you could, the, the, there's so many endless possibilities. I'm speechless mosquitoes yeah. that can't transmit disease, but oh, outcompete compete yeah. current mosquitoes, for example. And that's just, and we have a whole, so this is a big company, by the way, it's not like it's like me and a group of nerds in a room in a garage. You know, on the yeah. weekends. Yeah. This is a, this is a large company that's growing very rapidly and so on and so forth. But what we should do at some point, Jordan, is you, me, or maybe just you and Ben Lamb, the CEO should jump on. Cause he can talk you through, you know, I, I I'm probably being too cautious because for obvious reasons, there's certain information I can't divulge, but he's, he, he runs the show. So yeah, he's someone you'd be worth chatting with, but it is fascinating what they're doing, what what the group is doing, the future of this, like the profitability side of the business, the other animals that are on deck, uh, some of the larger implications for conservation, some of the larger implications for human health. Like there's a lot going on with this and it's it's really exciting. Yeah, definitely introduce me to Ben. I would love to talk with him. I think that, I mean, provided that he's able to slowly explain a lot of this stuff to me because it, <laughs> a lot of it's kind of complex. I mean, I didn't even understand the, the carbon footprint thing and that's probably the easy part. So Yeah, well, I he's smart enough to explain it to me and I'm a dum-dum, so he, I definitely <laughs> think he can get it through to you. <laughs> well, th thank you very much, man. I really appreciate you coming back on the show. We'll have you back again at some point, I'm sure. And uh, I, I just always appreciate the work that you do there's no scenario where i would go milk sea snakes so it really does take <laughs> not yet a special two or three breed. more podcasts we're going <laughs> to talk again about that yeah <laughs> exactly exactly thank you so much all right man. buddy thanks for having me thanks for checking out this entire episode of the jordan harbinger show if you're interested in exploring this topic further check out the jordan harbinger show podcast feed there, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.